So I, I tried to drive about 10 minutes to get an internet signal by parking outside a public library. That's and fine. other people had the same idea. So ah. then I raced back to the house and now I'm just trying to get- uh, And now you're using the old, the old, the, the old, the old dial-up. Well, I'm actually using my wife's phone because I dropped mine two days ago. And when I went to go test this about 20 minutes ago, of course, the glass is cracked right by the camera. So it looks like, I don't know, this. So I ran home. Of course, Vic's phone was not charged. So we quickly charged it. Anyway, we're here with Simon Sinek. It's, uh, live, hashtag live problems. Li live problems. Um, it's good to see. You know, I was, I was thinking uh, this morning. So my dad is in the house. And he reminded me of that time when I crashed your car. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, yeah I forgot about that. Yeah, I, I thought that'd be a fun story to start with. Uh, yeah, you you ripped the bumper off. Yeah, so it was it was you were you were very kind to let me borrow your car. I remember that. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the poor the poor charity guy. This is many years ago, and I drove it home uh, with my parents with Vic, and it was green, and it was parked. You know, on there's my little my little driveway. Fiat five hundred, right? Yep. And my dad thought it was a tree, so he just backed straight into it. Uh, it then <laughs> rolled down the hill. <laughs> And I remember coming out just like with this absolute horror. Oh my gosh, dad, you just drove into Simon Sinek's car and you drove it down the hill. And I was going to have to call you. And you were wonderfully gracious and generous uh, about it. And you said, it's just a thing or something like that. That's just why we have insurance it. is probably what I said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you want to know what happened to that car? Tell me. I loaned it to another friend. She took, she drove it upstate, skidded off the road in an ice storm and totaled it. Oh no. Thank goodness she was okay. But yeah, so that car was written off. So that car is no more. <laughs> but you know what, Simon, you're the kind of guy that is probably still loaning your car out. I do. It's, it's just a car. It's, it's why we have insurance. <laughs> yep. That's why I'd be we more have if I didn't have insurance. To share. Okay. Uh, tell me, uh, tell everybody where you're at. I'm in Los Angeles. Okay. And what's, what's it like? What's, what's going on? California was one of the first states to, to go into shelter at home. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been at this for over a month already. Um, and we've started to see a flattening of the curve out here, which has been really good. Yep. Um, uh, I mean, my experience is probably the same as everybody else's. <laughs> you know, it's one of the, I think it's one of I the nice things. I think it's one of the nice things that's come out of all of this actually, is that for the first time ever, like we can relate to everyone in the world. Like yeah. everyone in the world, no matter where you are, we have a COVID shelter at home, some sort of experience. Yep. And it's kind of an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think uh, our, our level, I would hope that we exit this with higher levels of, of empathy uh, towards all sorts it, it, of- Definitely different. in the short term, the question is, can we, re can we maintain it? I remember September 11th, I was in New York City after September 11th, and it was the most magical city in the world. Like crime disappeared for months, but it went back to normal. Yeah. Um, what, what's your schedule like? What's kind of your rhythm? Are you waking up at the same time? Like how, what, what is that? What is a day in quarantine or, or a weekday or a weekend for Simon look like? A, yeah, there's no weekends or weekdays. The, the, I'm actually busier than I've ever been, if I'm honest, um, because, you know, most of our income came from live events. Yeah. And so no live events anymore. So we've actually, we've all been uh, to the grindstone, heads down, trying to re completely reinvent our company. Um, you know, I'm not going to let this put us out of business. So we're going to, we're going to, we've, we're finding new ways. We're launching, we, we've done months worth of work in two weeks, you know, it's kind of been amazing to watch this incredible team. And so I think next week we launch a whole bunch of online learning for how to deal with stuff like this, like how to pivot under pressure, how to have difficult conversations, how to do, you know, how to have huddles, things like that. So, so yeah, we have a whole bunch of stuff we're launching next week, which I'm so proud of the, the company for, for figuring out. We've never had anything like that. 
people just go to your website to sign yeah. up and, and get that stuff? Yeah, SimonSinga.com. So yeah, so we it's been it's been really busy. I'm actually uh, I'm actually looking forward to the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> How has it been for you to not travel? I mean, you know, you and I oh, spend a lot of time on the road. Wonder. Yeah. <laughs> right. This, this is like a dream. Yeah. No. Look, the there's 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 look the, the, what I find so fascinating about some of these experiences is there's many different compartments of this experience, right? Yeah. There's the intellectual, like, hmm, this is like what's happening? How to understand this? You know, how does it affect our lives? There's there is the social, like. It, every time we open, turn on the news, heartbreaking. Yeah. And there's the moral, like, I just want to see this done right. I want to do everything I can, figure out ways that I can support the frontline, uh, uh, frontline healthcare workers and all of the others who are involved on the frontline who go to work every day, even people in essential industries who have to go to work every day, food, everything to do with food. Like, we have steady supply of food because people are going to work. Yeah. So... Then there's the like then there's the like the personal like how how are each of us dealing with this at home you know um then there's the financial you know uh we have to react to this and we we have a company and we we're trying very very hard to make sure that we can we can we can keep it solvent um so it's it's kind of amazing like you, you could have depending on what compartment you're in you can there's excitement there's sad there's frustration there's, it's, it's really kind of fascinating, I find. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, uh, you and I got to catch up, uh, I think it was last week, but we're in uh, Pennsylvania in a rented farmhouse. We've got four generations here. So my crazy kids who are three and five and are just uh, terrorizing pretty much everyone in the house, you know, missing their friends. And uh, just, it, it's a difficult, uh, At least difficult each other. adjustment. Uh, for kids and then we've got parents and then we've got grandparents or great grandparents of the kids and I think that I was asking a friend you know as you do how are you doing and he said I'm having an extremely wide range of experiences which I thought yeah. was a great way of putting it I mean yeah, I'm having kind of, I have I have all the feelings I, I, I find they're almost times when I want them Yeah, they're, they're almost euphoric moments of, wow, like we just cooked a meal together in a crock pot. Yeah. Like, this is the way that things should be. And yeah. then- Like, I mean, look, we have family dinner every single night, right? Yeah. Like, like this is like the 1950s. We're living in the 1950s here. It's kind of amazing. Yep. And then there are moments of sheer <laughs> panic, terror. Uh, oh my gosh, we're going crazy. <laughs> yeah. We're all, all the feelings. And we're all getting on each other's nerves. Uh, you, uh, you know, I think one thing you and I have, have well, I, I want everyone, we've got a lot of people uh, here who are supporting Charity Water. We've got 600 and some people or so um, that, that have joined us. So first of all, thank you for, for joining. Simon and I have known each other a very long time. He has been a uh, long-term supporter of Charity Water, of Vic and I personally. Um, he's actually also one of the 135 uh, individuals and families that pay for all of the overhead at Charity Water so that 100% of donations can go directly to build these water projects. So if you're a spring member and you're giving $10 a month, all $10 a month is going directly to the field. Uh, and that's thanks to, to Simon and, and 134 other families who, who don't mind uh, paying for those unsexy costs, the, the staff salaries, the office, the flights, the you know, Epson toner, uh, the you know the insurance or the phone bills, so Simon and I have known each other. Um, I, I don't I don't know if I actually can't remember when we first met, but I remember kind of the first uh, really uh, challenging conversation that I had with you, and we were we were on I think it was a summit series ship. It was a uh, summit at sea, the very first summit at summit sea. At sea, and we were up on you know one of the aft decks, and I you'll you'll have. I want to hear your recollection. I, I was going to say how you, all you, I want to hear your recollection because I have my, my yeah, recollection. Yeah, we should do this. So I, I remember I came in hot and I was talking about Charity Water and, you know, we've got this 100% model and we're going to bring clean and safe drinking water to the entire world and how, how I planned on raising all of this money. And then I think you said, that's not a lot of money. And that's not a very big, that's not very ambitious. <laughs> 
And, and then I remember shutting up. And I do remember, you know, you kind of encouraging me to think even bigger and saying, look, you know, what you're really doing is encouraging people to be generous, to look after their neighbors in need. Like this thing should be bigger than Walmart. I remember you saying that this should like the, the, the generous machine that you build, the community mobilizing machine to bring clean water to everybody on earth should be bigger than Walmart's. And I wasn't I wasn't thinking that big. Yeah, and we're not true. there yet, but uh, no, I but on, on, well on the way, well on the way to being what tell me, tell me what you remember. <laughs> My recollection was uh, uh, multiple people said that I had to meet you. And I, either I saw you or somebody saw you sitting up on the deck one evening. And so I came and sat down at your table. And I remember you being completely either unimpressed or you've like given this speech about charity water 400 times that day. And the last thing you wanted to do was do it again. And like I said, so can you tell me a little bit about what's going on? Because you were still, you were still, you were still in the, un, like not everybody knew who you were yet. And uh, I remember you just sort of like phoned it in. You're like, well, we're doing this and this, and you you were so used to being loved and adored with that with that pitch, <laughs> and 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 I and I remember that's when I remember now the I remember going, that's it, it's like, <laughs> yeah, and then you perked up, and then all of a sudden we were both engaged with each other. And then we had a different conversation. Yeah, and then um, and and the best part is a lifelong friendship uh, emerged. Yeah. You know, so many people listening. I'm sure. It, it made, by the way, it, it challenged the whole the whole thing of first of first impressions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think so many people are, are familiar with uh, your work around why and your book start with why. Uh, I remember a session we did together many, many years ago uh, when you came into Charity Water and helped us realize our why was not delivering people clean water. That was kind of the mission. That was the thing that we were doing. It was actually much bigger. It was... Yeah. Um, you know, some people kind of talk about that as the difference between vision and mission. But uh, I remember you said you're helping people see. It's seeing yeah. people see their impact. And, you know, we, we've talked for years about trying to reinvent charity or reimagine charity. Charity yeah. means love. Uh, it's a beautiful word. It's, it's uh, caritas in the Latin. It means to help your neighbor in need and get mm -hmm. nothing in return. It's kind of the, the highest level of unselfishness and, and giving. And you know, we've always believed many, that word has become tainted over time. Uh, many people have lost trust in charities. 42% of Americans polled said they don't believe, uh, they don't believe tra charities are trustworthy. More recently, 70% of Americans polled uh, believe charities wasted their money or didn't do the right yeah. thing with money. So we've kind of been on this 13 year crusade now to restore people's lost faith in giving and then the mission is when we do that, when we build this community, when we add up all that generosity, let's go do the most practical thing we can think of, which yep. is provide people with the most basic need for exactly. life, for, for water. And, um, and, and by the way, your organization is called Charity Water, not Water Charity. Right, right. And at the beginning, it was just Charity Colon, which was kind of this core, could we exactly invent right. charity? And the idea was after the colon, we might be able to do education or malaria. Correct. Or health or, Correct. Um, and I think and this is and this is why you're more like uh, a company like Apple and not like a company like Dell, which is because Dell defined itself by its product. It can only make that product. But because Apple defined right. itself by its cause, it can make phones and computers and, yep. you know, televisions and, you know, the whole thing. It, 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 it can go in many different directions. iTunes, yeah. you know. So you, you have that flexibility because you have a broader definition. Almost every other charity on the planet is defined by, by what they do. Yeah. Um, and then they don't play nicely with each other either. One of the things I remember you also helped us with was just kind of putting the language around hope and opportunity versus yeah. shame and guilt. You know, uh, yeah. so, many, so many charities are, you know, showing uh, the kid with flies and slow motion locking eyes and and saying, feel really bad, now give. And that's not what the great brands do. That's not what Nike does, right? Nike doesn't tell right. people that they're fat and lazy. Right. Hey, you know, go outside, buy our sneakers, go for a run. Now, Nike has been telling stories of people overcoming adversity, of uh, achieving the impossible. This belief have, 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 have that greatness is have you, ever heard this, have you ever heard the story that Phil Knight used to tell when, dis, when, when he would describe Nike? Have you ever heard the story? No, no, tell me. Oh, it's great. So he was... Um, 
he was at some large conference, you know, as, as CEOs go to, and he, he was invited to talk about Nike. And most of the, you and I have been to lots of these and CEOs stand up and they talk about, uh, you know, what their annual revenues are and what their growth yep. rates are and, you know, what their projections are. And, and that's how they describe their companies. You know, we're the best at this, we're the best at that. Phil Knight stood up and uh, he said, if you've ever gone for a run for exercise, can you please stand up? And most of the room stands up. You know, he yeah. says, if you go at least once a week, can you keep standing and everybody else please sit down? Now, you know, most of the room sits down. He says, if you go on a regular basis, like say two or three times a week, please keep standing, everybody else sit down. A few more sit down. He goes, if you go out, no matter what the weather is, no matter whether it's rain or shine, you still go out for a run, please keep standing. Now there's a smattering of people, right? He says, when you're out there, when it's cold and wet, and you're the only one out on the street, we're the ones standing under the lamppost cheering you on. That's a beautiful picture. And that's what just do it means. Yeah. Just do it is not for the ones who win. It's for the ones who try. It's for the ones right. who do. Just do it is the ones who get out there. It doesn't matter if you're an elite athlete or a first time, uh, first time exercising. Nike is the one that's standing next to you, cheering you on. And that's what their brand has always stood for. And Phil Knight would tell this metaphor, tell this story that so perfectly captured wh who they are and what they stand for. That that's, that's how Nike now has permission to make high fashion. Yep. I mean, they make stuff that has nothing to do with exercise or sports yep. now. Yep. Yep. It's high fashion. You can't buy high fashion from, you know, pick, a, pick another sneaker brand, you know? Yeah. Uh, I find that amazing. Um, Amy, you know, I, I know the why work was kind of your seminal work. It was many years ago. Um, anybody who's just crushing it lately, like who, who you know, in, in the last couple of years, who you just think is really getting it right? I mean, I think Brene's Brown, Brene Brown's work is, 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 is remarkable. And yeah. for her credit, she's taken this icky, ooey, gooey subject of vulnerability, and she's opened up a door for all of us to have a conversation about it yeah. uh, out loud, as opposed to privately with our therapists, you know? Um, or not at all, which is even worse. Um, so I think Brene's Brown is, Brene Brown's works is, is, you know, has to be, has to be uh, uh, thought of. And, and I know her and my work, you know, her name is brought up, the people who like my work bring up her name most often. And she tells me that the people who like her work bring up my work because it's so interesting because our work is complimentary, but it's definitely different. Yeah. And we're lucky enough to have both of you come and speak to our teams uh, for free. There you uh, go. When you're in New York. Which Big is, love. Uh, which, which feels like an honor to have you in front of 100 people. Um, that's been so valuable for us over time. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, you, know, you have a lot of people, <laughs> including myself and members of our team, who are really just trying to find the way to stay optimistic. And you, you know, you are a very optimistic person. I saw somebody just type in the notes, you know, thanks for the positivity. Um, that's great. I mean, I think you're, you're, the glass is always half full with you. You're the kind of guy that you know, it's completely full. It's not half full. It's completely full. It's completely full. Yeah. It's half full with milk and half filled with air. It's totally full. There you go. Um, say just a moment about staying optimistic. Um, as we know, we've got all sorts of people going through terrible sure. loss, going through health issues, going through, yes. you know, financial calamity. Uh, how, what's your advice for people? There, there's two things that I do that help me. Um, number one, my grandmother lived through the Blitz, and I remember, I remember that. I think of that. I think of that. You know, uh, the Germans bombed London for 11 weeks straight, um, and, and you weren't safe anywhere. And 60% of all homes were completely destroyed. Um, when we're at home, if we obey the rules of, 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 of social distancing and, and, and sheltering at home, we're, we're fine. Like if we're at home, we're fine. Yep. So I think of my grandmother, you weren't fine anywhere. And yeah. people, think about this, during, during the Blitz and during the war, people sent their children to live with strangers in the country for fear that they would get killed. So they figured if, 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 if somebody has to survive, better the children should survive Sure. Uh, and, and so lots and lots and lots of kids were raised by foster families and lost their parents. Can you imagine sending your children away for their own safety and never seeing them again? I mean, people did that. Yeah. Because it was, because it was the way to keep, keep the, the country alive for not risking the lives of children during the war. Um, 
And, and I think of my grandmother living through the Blitz and she would tell us stories about living through the Blitz. And I'm thinking to myself, like if I compare what we have to what they had, all the tragedy we have still pales in comparison to that. So the thinking is, it's not making a comparison, but rather if they can get through that, we can get through right. this. Right. That's what keeps me positive. If they, if they can get through that, we can get through this, right? So that's number one. And the other thing is, optimism is not the denial of reality. I'm not living in a cloud, right? Optimism is focusing on where we're gonna to get to. So we are in a dark tunnel filled with pain and angst. There are a lot of problems. I don't even think, like, the real problems haven't even begun. Like the mental health issues that our frontline healthcare workers are going to suffer after this is done. And that yes. many people who are living alone, like we consider uh, um, solitary confinement a form of torture. You can't, you, you, to take people away from people, you know, online is a big deal. And, and, and I think phone is really important. Hearing someone's tone of voice, like yeah. text less, call more, you know? Yes. Um, uh, I, just Hamilton broke into my, my mind, you know, talk less, smile more, you know, uh, but, but text less, uh, uh, talk more, like, is really, really important right now. And I think that we're, we have to start preparing for the problems that are going to happen um, and how we stop those. But the point is, is I don't deny the fact that we're in a dark tunnel, but what I see is the light at the end. I don't know how far away it is, but I yeah. see that little, that little bright dot. And that's where I focus my attention. Yes, that's great. That's great stuff. Yeah, I, I think too, one, one thing that's just been working for me is just trying to express gratitude out loud, uh, especially with, you know, with my kids and just, cause, cause I, I wake up cranky, not enough sleep. I had two kids climb into the bed last night and like pushing me off and it, you know, terrible night's sleep. And you kind of wake up and the days run together. Like, is it a Friday? Is that any different than a Saturday or a Sunday or a Monday? And just practicing gratitude. What are yeah. the, the, the list of things? And sometimes we'll just sit around on the couch and we'll try to get to 50, you know? And I don't know, the kids will be thankful for a bird or, a, you know, or Legos or, yeah. or thankful for the TV that they get to watch or chocolate yeah. chip cookies or, you know, but it, it changes you, you know, you list out, 20 30 50 things yeah you are you're transformed through that process just yeah. through that kind of mind uh exercise and you yeah, we're, we're, we're doing the same thing we're, we're doing the same thing and i find that my gratitude nearly every night is i'm grateful for my family yes you know like i find that i find myself saying the same thing over and over again you know um i'm i'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by 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 that yeah um you know, I just thought of a, an exercise that anyone can do. You know, the problem is we can get in these spirals of thinking about all the bad things and, it, and, and it, it, it can eat at us. And so a great little exercise to do is take a piece of paper and write down 20 good things that are happening or will come out of this. Yeah. 20, you know, um, reconnecting with people I haven't seen in a while, learning to be grateful, learning to say I love you, um, uh, appreciating the importance of human relationships, um, redefining redefining what what a success means in america you know we we over indexed on productivity we thought that if you're productive you're doing well yes and and now the, the, we have sort of this 1950s lifestyle now where we have family dinner every night and like all of this and redefining that joy and success and happiness isn't doesn't hinge on our productivity that it's more it's more it's more uh uh it's broader than that and I think these are very, very positive things that are happening and will, will re remain beyond, I hope. Yeah, I, I found just the slowing down, and it doesn't sound like you've slowed down much, uh, but you know, from, certainly from travel and rushing back and forth to JFK and I don't know, 70 or 80 flights a year, and you know, yeah. late for a gate, gate changes, right? There's just kind of a, there's a hurry in, well, there's a hurry in so much of my life. Yeah. And, just cooking a di you know, cooking meals, right? Like using my hands. Yeah, I don't really use my hands for anything. But I, I, I know, was cutting something the other day. And, you know, we've got a little bit of property here on this farmhouse. And I, I bought a machete for $10 the other day. And I just started hacking thorns. I bought, I awesome. bought, a, I bought a bird feeder. Yes, we have, I, I, I did that too. I I'm got looking, like suet, I'm, I'm right now boxes. while I'm talking to you looking at the birds eating. I'm loving it. I think I'm yeah. getting old. 
Oh my yeah, God, I'm speaking I did, I did the same I'm watching thing. birds. I was, I was this is what my life has become. So fun. Uh, but yeah, I just, I, and, and I don't want to go back to some of those, uh, you know, some of those unhealthy habits of hurry. You know, that was, I was talking with um, a group of, of kind of, I've got a little CEO group uh, of, of guys that I spend time with. And one of the observations is we are all probably going to have this instinct to make up for lost time. And we should actually resist that, right? This kind of this, this flurry of activity. Okay, well, we missed all these speeches. So should we get on more stages? Should we do more? But that's kind of the, the you know, this fear of missing out. And I think yeah. there's a real health in saying we are not going to make up for lost time. If this is a month or three months or six months or a year, however long this, this lost time is. And we're actually going to embrace the healthiest of our new rhythms. Having meals together as a family, cooking more, walking in the woods, uh, not sleeping with our phones. You know, which it's a great time to try that. <laughs> you know, you get to kind of try all these different things because uh, you, you're establishing a new normal. Yeah. So I think that's that's one of the things because I know my instinct is going to be, you know, okay, wow, well I had twelve speeches canceled. You know, let me go figure out how to how to make up for the the audiences of the, of the 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 donations that we weren't able to get. Right. Um, and I think uh, that'll be that would be unhealthy. It's part of the journey, you know. Um, this will change us. You know, like if you think about our grandparents who lived through the Great Depression or the Second World War, you know, they became really frugal and miserly. Like they, ch they saved every empty glass bottle and reused every piece of tinfoil, yeah. you know. Um, this is going to change. Our, we're, you and I are too old, but, but kids now who are, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, like they were on one path and now they're on a different path, you know. Um, and... Uh, I'm very curious what, what will happen to this young generation, what kind of adults they're gonna be because of this. You know, um, it'll be fascinating. It's gonna be really interesting, but it, it'll, it'll definitely have an impact.